Hey guys, I just recorded a brand new message called Correlation versus Causation. I think you're going to really love it. It's on my podcast channel and it will be coming on other platforms. And I'm speaking about how much in the world at the moment we are really making things fit together, correlation that don't fit together, and we're creating outcomes, causation that are not accurate at all. So I'm spending some time unpacking that with us all. I think you're going to love this message. Before you get started on today's podcast with Paul Scanlon, we just wanted to let you know that he now has a free course available to you. If you head over to paulscanlon.com forward slash free course, you'll be able to sign up to his video series called The Five Behaviors of Successful People. We hope that this course adds value to your life. Now enjoy the podcast. We're going to get into the Word of God together and I'm going to read to you guys from Acts 28. The first six verses. Once safely on shore, we found that the island was called Malta. The islanders showed us unusual kindness. They built a fire and welcomed us all because it was raining and cold. Paul gathered a pile of brushwood and as he put it on the fire, a viper driven out by the heat fastened itself onto his hand. When the islanders saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to each other, this man must be a murderer, for though he escaped from the sea, justice had not allowed him to live. But Paul shook the snake off into the fire and suffered no ill effects. The people expected him to swell up or suddenly fall dead, but after waiting a long time and seeing nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and said he was a god. <laughs> what a range of opinion about Paul in such a short time. You all know the story, I think, don't you, that uh, Paul survived the shipwreck. Uh, everyone survived the shipwreck because of an angel appearing to Paul on the ship and assuring him that none of the lives would be lost on the ship if they stayed with the ship. And though the ship broke up, which is a little thought there for us, that even, even though an angel appeared and said to him, no lives will be lost. They were still going to go through a shipwreck um, during the process of no lives being lost. Sometimes a great outcome doesn't mean there's going to be no drama in between now and the great outcome. <laughs> um, and then they get on the island and Paul is gathering firewood. Obviously, they're freezing and cold um, on the island of Malta in the Mediterranean. And the locals on the island, the Maltese people, obviously were helping them recover and get warm. And, and, and Paul's gathering wood and a snake bites him. And when the local people saw that, they said amongst themselves, or perhaps out loud, wow, um, the gods must really have it in for this guy, I suppose, is what they're saying. Because though he, though he survived the shipwreck, he must be such a bad person that the universe, the gods, the powers that be um, have decided he's going to get it anyway. So you think you've beaten fate by escaping the shipwreck, but a snake is going to take you out. That was what they decided and said. Then a few minutes later, when the venom should have killed him by then, and it hadn't, they changed their minds and decided, wow, Instead of him being a criminal and his time has come because he's an evil person, uh, he's clearly a god. <laughs> How fickle people are. What, what they're doing, I want to use a word with you guys. Um, it is a beautiful word, but it is not an often used word in English language and perhaps the language perhaps you're listening in from anywhere in the world. But the word is correlation. Correlation. What they are doing is creating a correlation connection between two things that they think mutually belong together. The correlation in their case was um, the snake bite uh, and his evil nature. Those two correlating things made them decide what was going on. And I want to speak to you for a few minutes about the relationship between correlation and another beautiful word, that we rarely use, causation. Correlation and causation. And 
what the Maltese people were doing and what I'm going to show you we're doing all the time and it's becoming a massive problem, especially now was with what's happening in the world with the pandemic and with the whole uh, racial awareness in the world um, that's going on is that they're not just correlating two things together. They're deciding the cause of this must be because he is a bad person and the gods, the powers that be, whatever they worshipped and whatever their language was for this uh, divine power that makes sure we all get what we deserve. This, And a lot of Christians believe the same thing, by the way, about God, that God is this sort of divine, vindictive being with a killer surveillance system <laughs> and he get away with nothing uh, is what they thought about Paul. So they've put the correlation together of the snake bite and his evilness um, and came out with a conclusion that he was a bad person. When he didn't die, they had to reconfigure their correlation and causation. So they refigured it as, oh, well, maybe the snake bite wasn't to prove he was a bad person. It was to prove he's a god and he's immune. And the swiftness with which they switched correlation and causation is scary. But we all do it all the time. And I think we're in a time in the world now, guys. And this is why I wanted to speak to you about it at this time. I don't normally like to speak a message or to a camera like this and date a thing. Because by the time people see the video, um, it is not relevant anymore. But I think because at this time I'm doing this recording, I'm talking about two things that are not just going to date this. They are shaping our world. It's kind of like ignoring 9-11 when that happened. Um, and even still years later, it is relevant to talk about in the effect it had on our world. So the pandemic that we're in the midst of, um, we're in June uh, 2020 now. And the race riots and the uprising around the world, the revolution that's taking place, following the death of a guy called George Floyd. I'm going to mention him too because he should be immortal, memorialized like others before him. Is why I think I should just speak about the context in which I'm speaking to you guys in at this time. So around the idea of the pandemic and, and, and racism and so on, and other big issues in the world that have come and gone and will do the same thing, I think we humans have this capacity and almost an addiction to make certain things fit together. And then that allows us to decide why things are happening in the world. So we have multiple conspiracy theories, as you know, um, about COVID and China and how it all happened and multiple conspiracy theories that are still occurring on the internet. And what's happening is what we are doing is we are creating correlations between things that we think mutually belong together and explain a cause that tidies up for us um, what we think that's about, like the islanders did on Malta about Paul. I think we are seeing it constantly now on social media, um, in the news and journalism, that we are saying... Um, those things belong together and because those things we decide belong together then we're deciding that the cause of this is such and such it could be um supposedly trump's collusion with russia with regard to the um elections it could be um how we think about uh the relationship the correlation between drugs and crime, or suffering and sin. Think about where you make these connections on a large or a small scale. That is called correlation. And I think it's a very dangerous thing to be casual about. I wanted to draw your attention to it and use these words and get you to think about where you and I may be doing this on a daily basis, on massive and small things. 
where we go to a default autopilot mode um, of either buying into someone else's idea of that correlation and therefore the cause must be this or our own um, ideas about correlation and causation. I think it's very dangerous and I'm appealing to you today to be careful about where you are doing that, about where we are doing that because what no one tells us about correlation is that everybody creates a correlation and a causation based on the way in which they frame life. The way in which you frame life and see life determines what you think are in a correlation relationship or not. So to go back to the, the Islanders on Malta, they had clearly a way that they framed the world and framed God and divinity because they believed that bad things happen to bad people was their frame, which, by the way, is still a widespread frame, um, particularly amongst evangelical Christians, that bad things don't happen to good people. Bad things happen to bad people. You kind of get what you deserve. You, you reap what you sow. So their framing of life was that Paul must have deserved this, even though they didn't know him, didn't know his life, his character, um, just judged him on a snake bite. What is the equivalent of that in us? Where are we seeing somebody experience a snake bite, an event in their lives, something that happens to them, and we decide that means this? When we do that, guys, it's because we have a, a preconceived way of looking at life. It's called a frame. I'm looking at you now through these glasses. Maybe you're looking at me through glasses. And you're looking at me on a device. My glasses, your glasses, the device I'm speaking to you through and the one you're watching me through have a frame. I can't see my frame. I can only see you. If you're wearing glasses, you can't see your frame. You can only see me. So you don't think you have a frame. But I can see your frame. When we both got glasses on, I can see your frame. and You can see mine. So when we speak to each other, we are aware, and I want you to be aware, of the frame from which people are making correlations and deciding cause and effect. Because we are defaulting to a way that we frame life, as the Maltese people did, um, as white people do, as black people do, um, as different nationalities and races do, because these are all the things that shape our frame. Much of our frame that we don't know we have, we don't know we have it because it was chosen for us um, by nature and nurture. By the time we were age 10, our frame was pretty much set for life, guys. I know that's a scary thing to say, but there are enough tests historically to establish that by the age of 10, our deep set biases in life or our framing of life is pretty much established. That's why when it comes to the issue of racism, I think unless we speak to the emerging generation about this in a way that is, that is very careful, it's not enough for me as a white guy to raise my white kids to say, you know, we're Christians, we love everyone. That's not enough. Because that's not doing enough to, to deconstruct and dismantle and carefully protect them from inheriting a default framing with regard to white privilege and racism that I didn't know they got. So I think when it comes to framing, and remember that term, write that term down, framing. Everybody is doing life with a certain frame. We are all framing, guys, uh, this pandemic in a certain way. Some are framing it as an opportunity. Some are framing it um, as the worst thing that ever happened to them and are not handling it well, um, may not recover from it. Um, and I'm not judging anybody in that because it's been terrible for people around the world in multiple ways. But I think, um, and I've done a lot of you know stuff online and interviews and so on about how I'm viewing the pandemic. And I've talked a lot about um, people move either to stability or to 
resilience. And when you move, when your framing in life is to move to stability, uh, it's because you think I'm going to weather this storm, I'm going to batten down the hatches, weather the storm and get through it. That's, that's a stability, a stabilizing behavior. But resilience doesn't weather the storm. It uses the storm to get better and stronger and smarter and creative and inventive. And like the economic crisis of 2008, many people made their fortunes in that downtime, in that crisis, in that global financial pandemic, if you like. It's because of the way they framed what was going on. And I want you to understand as you're listening to me that, that even now as you're listening to me, your internal psychological framing and conceptual framing is governing how you even hear what I'm saying to you now. If you've taken offense to anything I've said, any random word I used, um, any way that I put a thought together, um, a trigger word even that I don't know is a trigger word for you or you don't know it's one for me, whether it was white privilege or whether it was racism uh, or nationality, um, whatever it was, if it's a trigger word, it's triggering because you have a frame that makes that word a little minefield for you. And I want to ask you, is that okay? Where did that triggering come from in you and in me? And is that okay? Because if we just live with it, we're forever concluding that the snake bite is an act of God and they're bad people. We're forever concluding, and this, this is what's happening again to go back to the whole racism thing in the world, guys. Um, we're forever going back to the the casual but tragic default mindsets that a black guy jogging in a white neighborhood on Mount Aubrey must be a criminal. He must be a danger. And the next thing you know, he's dead. That is a correlation, an instant, an instantaneous correlation. The snake bit him, he's an evil person. It's that instantly. He's a black guy jogging in a white neighborhood, equals he's a danger, he's a criminal. We've had multiple examples of that in the media um, besides his example. And it's because we're making this correlation based on our default autopilot framings that have very tragic outcomes potentially, as in that case. A less dramatic outcome may be, but still tragic, is that we shut down voices in our lives that we need. We remove ourselves from opportunities that we would have been better pursuing. That we become narrow and judgmental and unkind when we could have been open-minded and learned and grown and become better people by the thing that our frame made us be resistant to. So I want you to think about where are you, where am I, framing a thing that suits the way that we see life, it suits our philosophy, our ideology, but it's creating a correlation and a causation that may just not be true. And based on that, based on that, um, lie, that wrong perception, that false conclusion, we are making decisions in life. Some of them are huge. And I think it's that level of conversation we have to have with ourselves in our own internal ecosystems and with those that we have influence over, either as parents or as leaders, that we have to question the frame. What is the frame? I would encourage you, and I've done this a lot recently, to to ask people, um, hang on a minute, why did you say that? I think you have a, whatever the frame is you think you're dealing with, I think you have a youth frame and your youth frame is causing you not to be able to see other perspectives or your married status frame um, or your social economic class frame um, or your religious frame or your stage and age of life frame. Whatever the frame is that you and I think may prevent us from 
seeing something hugely important to us is what is happening all the time around the world, millions and millions of times a day, and it's deepening the division between us as humans because we're creating correlations that are not genuine, don't exist, and are erroneous. And we are concluding things that that means that are not true. Um, this is what happened with Job. You remember Job was suffering and his friends... <laughs> His friends came to see him to explain to him what they think was happening. And there's chapter after chapter in the book of Job where his friends are trying to create artificial correlations to explain what caused it in his life. Were you unkind to someone years ago? Did you neglect to help the poor and the weak and the sick? Were you not generous when you should have been to a homeless person, to use a modern day equivalent? Um, did you steal from someone? Um, did you do a dodgy business deal? Didn't you speak up for injustice when you could? And so on and so on. And for days, his friends tried to help him find out what was it in his life that was wrong to create a correlation that proved why God was punishing him. And of course, we know, don't we, as we read on at the end of Job's suffering, that God steps in with his own questioning of the questioners, saying to them, really, if you guys had a brain, you'd be dangerous, is what God kind of said, because God's first opening response wasn't an explanation of this is what's really happening with Job. He's a great guy, and he's part of this kind of um, cosmic experiment which you know um, was no fun for Job I'm not saying that but I think when God stepped in he asks them uh, do you know where the snow's kept or where lightning is stored or do you know when um, the wild goats give birth and God goes on with his own list of questions to let them know that their pitiful attempts to connect things together in a need to explain and tidy up Job's life, which is often why we reach for correlation. Correlation lets us explain what happened to Paul and the snake. But correlation lets us keep our frame intact. It tidies everything up. It's what I call the sin of certainty that we are obsessed with our need to be certain that we are right and you are wrong. So we create a correlation that keeps our frame in place, that makes us feel right and keeps you being the wrong person. And we're afraid to have the debate. I'm finding this with racism around the world. A lot of white people are afraid to have the debate. I get people in my comments when I post something jumping on with hatred um, and with just these statements and these conclusions, and I know it's from their framing. And when I go back to them, challenging them, they don't respond back. They don't want a discussion. They just want to spew hatred and want to spew narrow-mindedness because they think this equals that. And what this does is it keeps us continually divided because it's our, it's our desire to be certain that what we believe and how we think is right and how other people think that's different to us is wrong. It's destroying our humanity. It's killing us in the church, guys. It is fostering separateness and tribalism um, and war amongst us. This is why I've taught for years now about um, the need for nuance. Nuance is a French word that means shade. And for years I've taught our need to have an open-mindedness to multiple shades on the same thing, that it isn't all either or left or right, Republican or Democrat, male or female, gay or straight, black or white, rich or poor, um, that there's nuance. And, and I believe that tyranny is the deliberate removal of nuance. When I don't allow you to have a shade different to me, then I am dictating to you the only shade it can be. And if I can't discuss with you what you want to talk about because I don't appreciate 
the shade you've chosen, then again, we're separate, we're divided because we are stuck inside our framing that we don't know that we have. I want to say in the church world, guys, for us, that um, one of the reasons I stopped saying as much as I used to say as a pastor, God told me. I felt God speak to me. Um, I felt God um, put on my heart. I felt God put this thought in my mind. I felt the Holy Spirit um, speak to me about this. I think in the church, in Pentecostal charismatic churches, we use that language all the time. And I think it's unhelpful because the moment I say to you, I feel God told me, then I'm telling you my frame. My frame is I have a direct line with God um, that you maybe don't. And now anything you say that challenges me, you've got to deal with that I think you are challenging God. Add to that that I may be the pastor, the man of God, the great preacher. And I keep saying, God told me, God told me. I've got a word from God for you. Um, again, what it does is it creates a correlation that I want you to have about me. We want people to have about us as believers. We want the correlation to be uh, about us, that God speaks to us. And so when we post and when we speak and when we go on camera and when we say something and when we preach, it's not like when other people speak because we are, we are divinely inspired. God spoke to us. And so if I go around using my position and my status, um, such as that might be in people's minds, you know, as a preacher, a pastor or whatever, a man of God or whatever, and this isn't just a church thing, but I'm speaking especially to us in the church where we use this God told me stuff. Again, I think what it does is, and I, and, I, and I don't mean God doesn't speak to us humans. I don't mean that. I just don't think we need to be saying it all the time because I think we use it as a way to get leverage in people's minds. We, 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 leverage, we leverage our authority. We leverage our relevance and our importance by using God told me. So I want you again to think how often in a day do you either say that or hear that or think that, which means you stack in your favor the correlation between how you speak and where you think it comes from, and therefore the cause of our not agreeing with you is because we're against God. And so it builds up other layers of resistance between you and I because you've allowed that very powerful Religious framing, theological framing, biblical framing to be one that you saying to me is a non-negotiable. This is the only way to see other people posting on my social media when I spoke about racism. If people had correct theology, this wouldn't be a problem. And I've gone back and said to them, please tell me what correct theology is. Guys, nobody, nobody just reads the Bible. Nobody. <laughs> We all read the Bible with a frame and we see what we want to see. And we read the Bible according to our race and our gender and our circumstances and our life experiences and our socioeconomic background and so on and so on. We read the Bible like that. And, and even, if, even if what someone says to us is true, we still have to decide what that means to us. It can't be, well, because you said it, that must be true. Yeah, it may be true to you. This may be your truth. I, I don't think at all when I speak to camera or post things on social media or preach in a church, I don't think at all that because something's good for me, it may be good for you. I try to speak in a way that I'm saying, you know, I think this is what I think. I've got an idea about this. I've got some wisdom on this, I think. Um, but it may land different in your life. I think we live in a world of echo chambers, guys, don't we? We live in a world where, where the whole internet and social media is tracking us. There's a killer surveillance system that has. Every search you put in, even if you're in a conversation around Alexa <laughs> or your phone, you're getting stuff in your feed that you didn't type anything about. You just spoke about it. And the devices are listening. 
Next thing you know, they're sending you stuff about the thing you spoke about a couple hours ago. What it's doing is, is, that, is that social media and the internet is surrounding us with the things that we speak about and it becomes, it becomes a digital virtual echo chamber and we can have the same thing in life relationally and in the church where we only hear the voices that echo back to us um, about the things we're speaking about, the things we're interested in. And you finish up believing that that is the only thing to think and say about that. And I think the church world, we have our own, we have our own echo chamber bubble. We have that about, in, we have that in our race and our nationalities and our genders. There's all kinds of echo chambers. And, and I'm trying to commit at this age and stage of life with all that's happening in the world, I'm appealing to you guys to do the same, that we don't, don't get stuck in an echo chamber of our own making and we make a God in our own image and we commit the sin of certainty, which is what the, the golden calf was about. Let's make an image that gives us a God we can touch and see and worship and be centered on um, because we want to be certain of the God we worship because Moses has gone and we don't see any more supernatural interventions from God. So we need to create a God we can relate to. And what they did was they created a relationship with how they thought about God rather than a relationship with God. That's what we do when we frame, have an echo chamber, create artificial correlations that mean this is the causation. And I want us to work at doing that less and seeing in each other's and helping each other to stop that and to break free from that behavior that I think we humans do hugely at the moment in the world. All right. Thank you for taking the time to listen to Paul Scanlon's podcast channel. We just wanted to remind you about the free course that's available to you on the five behaviors of successful people. So go and head over to paulscanlon.com forward slash free course to sign up for that today. And please do subscribe, share and review this podcast channel.